Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. some time in my time to kind of be around different things but the reason I was around them was just because there was um, an opportunity and I didn't say no like I was like all right I'll try it until somebody kicks me out of here hello and welcome to another episode of in the envelope I am here once again to introduce this episode and today's guest, the incredible, talented, brilliant, and beautiful Renee Elise Goldsberry, whose dulcet tones you just heard. Recurring themes we've heard on this podcast before. Some were touched on in this interview and some in brand new ways that kind of opened my eyes and blew my mind. Renee is someone who has reinvented herself, or rather has not approached the entertainment industry as just one thing. She's very much has training in music and in theater, both classical and modern. She, of course, has done screen work and kind of got her start on Ally McBeal and then a soap opera and then started in a film called All About You and has been working steadily ever since and is, of course, best known as Angelica Schuyler in Hamilton. She's spoken in Backstage before, of course, about Hamilton. It is so cool, once again, just like our, with our David Diggs episode recently, it's so cool to kind of relive the 2015 Tony season of just the seismic impact that Hamilton had on the New York community at that time, to kind of relive it now in 2020 and 2021 with its premiere as a film on Disney+. Plus. It's so cool. Renee had some really cool thoughts about that. And just some really great all-around inspiration for artists, for people, for those looking for hope that coming out slowly but surely of this pandemic, that we are operating in spaces that are more diverse and inclusive. And uh, I just love talking to her so much. And this interview is also pegged to the new show Girls 5 Eva, which premieres on Peacock today, the day of this podcast release, May 6th. Just to give some context there, Renee plays a character named Wiki, who is one of the st- one of the band members of Girls 5 Eva, a group of five diva female pop stars from the 90s. They were sort of a one-hit wonder in the 90s, and they are now making a comeback in today's times as middle-aged women. So the show is so much fun because it involves so many quick flashbacks to the 90s. It's created by Meredith Scardino, but executive produced as well by Tina Fey and Robert Carlock, who are known for, of course, 30 Rock and Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. It's sort of in that vein. Renee had wonderful things to say about how to perform that kind of comedy. Basically, this interview is wonderful, and it's chock full of actionable advice, inspiration, all of my favorite, favorite things to talk about. So, Renee, if you're listening, thank you so much for joining us. Do stay tuned afterward to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, who will point you to some excellent pieces of content on Backstage.com. Thank you, as always, for listening. Let's take a quick break and then get to this wonderful interview with Renee. This podcast is, of course, brought to you, listeners, by Backstage. Listen, aside from all the great inspiration and tips and all of that stuff we offer for free, like this amazing podcast, Backstage also gives you access to incredible casting calls all over the world. That is why it's the world's number one casting platform. If you're curious or if you're an actor yourself and you really want to jumpstart your career and you're ready to take the advice and the inspiration you've heard here in this very episode and use it, go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code ENVELOPE. E-N-V-E-L-O-P-E. That's, again, 30 days completely free to try backstage where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start browsing the casting notices, and start applying to jobs. Because who knows? Maybe one day 
I'll be interviewing you. Again, that's backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code ENVELOPE. Renee Elise Goldsberry is best known for her Tony Award-winning role as Angelica Schuyler in the Broadway musical Hamilton, the filmed version of which premiered last year on Disney+. She's worked on stage in Shakespeare productions The Color Purple, Rent, and Good People, as a recording artist, including on her breakout film All About You, and on TV projects such as Ally McBeal, One Life to Live, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, Altered Carbon, and now the new Meredith Scardino musical comedy on Peacock, Girls 5 Eva. Here is the amazing Renee Elise Goldsberry. Are you in like your recording studio? Um, I'm in um, the guest room of my house. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, this this kind of has become my office since since COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, what a year! What a it's, year. this would be a completely right. different interview at any point in the last year, and here we are. Like, <laughs> I'd be different tomorrow. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk about Girls Five Eva. I definitely want to ask about Hamilton, of course. And what a strange thing to relive that whole experience. Uh, we just we just spoke to David about m- much of the same thing. Wow. But, um, yeah. So talk to me about this past year. I mean, have you been you've been doing okay? It's it seems like kind of a, a great year career wise amid uh, otherwise crummy year. <laughs> yes. Uh, gosh, a couple of months ago they did a big feature of some sort on like CBS Sunday Morning about. COVID and the arts and they asked me to represent the arts and talk about what the year had been like. And I felt, you know, so honored to have have been asked, but so uncomfortable being the spokesperson because this year has been so strangely incredible for me professionally. (laughs) And that definitely doesn't represent what our experience has been as artists. Um, So, so yeah, sometimes in the middle of a storm, you know, a, a flowers bloom and uh and we 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 all have seen that in our lives um in different areas and i definitely have seen it professionally um but you know um it's uh the the pain of what we've been through is not is not lost on me at all but i i have been able to work um in very strange ways mm-hmm. And I should also say we've all been working, um, but I, I actually, you know, I, I got to shoot the show yeah. in the middle of COVID, and uh, they created a bubble of sorts, and and we got to we got to make something and get paid for it, which is a miracle ever, always, but especially this past year. And a musical TV show, it sort of blows my mind that it was all filmed in COVID because it it seems like too ambitious of a project to <laughs> be able to pull that off. Absolutely. Um, very did you have so much fun? How did you get involved with Girls 5 Eva? I just got a call and an email. Um, I guess I guess they Tina Fey and Meredith Scardino, it crossed their mind. Yeah, I'd been in a movie with Tina. Um, it's called Sisters. Mm-hmm. Um, and by had been, I mean, I was in it before they finished editing it. And I was no longer in it when it was done. <laughs> the, oh, okay. But I, I played a I played a bigger role in Sisters than you would ever see, and um, so I, I've known her. And you know, Tina and Jeff have been clearly, you know, wonderful gifts to the Broadway community. Mm. Um, so I I knew her because we were both moms from New York City, and sure, we'd sure. worked together. But when she came to see Hamilton, I feel like she wrote me a letter that was kind of like kind of sheepishly. I'm so sorry I got you out of this movie. When we oh, shot Sisters, um, we had done you know. Uh, Um, Brian Darcy James is also in that movie sisters and Mm -hmm. Brian and I had just done the workshop of Hamilton. Wow. And in the summer between the workshop of Hamilton and the public theater production, we got this part to shoot this, you know, we got, we we both got these parts in the sisters movie. And so we would sit there on set and be like, Oh my God, can you believe what nobody knows? what we're about to do. Like we were just like, we would just sit around by ourselves and be like, holy shit. Like our, you know, our brains exploding and we didn't even know how big it would be, but we just knew it was so amazing. So cool. So cool. So yeah, so I knew her from then and uh, they called and asked if I wanted to uh, be a part of this brilliant, crazy thing. And I said, yes. 
Yeah. Is it safe to say, I mean, those of us who've been watching you on stage and I've I've seen you, I I saw the original cast of Color Purple. Oh, and cool. I also saw Good People. Um, yes. And a couple of other shows that have demonstrated your like comedic talents. But I think for <laughs> most people, this role, is it safe to say is a departure? I mean, how, how new, how much of new territory is Wiki? It's so funny. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like new territory for me mm. as a performer. And it doesn't feel like new territory for me as just a human being. Cause if you know me, I'm just ridiculously silly. <laughs> um, so um, it definitely feels like a huge departure in terms of like the characters, you know, being so self-involved okay. and me feeling like I'm a little bit more humble than she is. Um, but, <laughs> but definitely the rest of it doesn't feel crazy. And I, I feel like I've been so blessed with such a varied career that if you actually are, you know, I don't, I don't know how often people are paying that much attention to what I'm doing, but if you have paid attention, you're absolutely right. There was good people and there was the com the brilliant comedy in that moment. There was um, yeah. gosh, so many, you know, I mean, even a musical comedy, like this Zoe's playlist show. I, I did yeah. that a couple episodes of that, you know, right before COVID and, you know, Paula Pell and I uh, did documentary now's spoof yeah. of company um, on AFC, you know, so, so I've been around doing these things. Um, yeah. It's just great to be so well supported in in a show that has um, so much opportunity for me to do more. Is there like a specific um, style of comedy in like the Robert Carlock, Tina Fey, yes. and of course in this case, Meredith Scardino, like is there a world? I, I'm curious, like how do you approach this brand of comedy? Such a great question that I asked a million times and nobody ever <laughs> answered me. <laughs> uh, gosh, you're so you're so right. Um, there's a tone. There's yeah. there's a very specific tone. It's funny. I don't know if this is a spoiler. I don't know if they've yeah. announced yet about any of the of the people. I'm sure everybody knows Andrew Re um, Reynolds is, is it does a does an arc on our show. God bless mm -hmm. him for doing it. Um, the first day I saw him on set. <laughs> <laughs> we were in some like huge mansion. I, have you seen the show? I, yes. I do. Um, this episode two starts with me doing like this Cribs episode of Wiki's World. Yes. <laughs> so I'm like in this really long wig, like showing way too much of my midriff to be my age. And <laughs> uh, he was shooting some pickup stuff just because we were on that location, even though he's not in that location. So I see him in some bedroom of this strange mansion and he's got this blonde wig on. And he says to me, um, Hi, what is the tone of the show? And you know, he's, I've just been watching him on, um, what's the show that they're, the, uh, God, that brilliant Black Monday. Have yes. you seen his show? Yes. I'm like, you know, I know him very well from being in Hamilton and I, he, I just, I'm, I love him as a human being, but I had, I haven't talked to him for a while. I've just been watching <laughs> his show Black Money. So I'm like, oh my God, I'm your stalker fan. Now you're so brilliant in that show. And he's like, thanks. What's the tone <laughs> of this show? And I was like, gosh, Andrew, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, and like, you know, they have such a great track record. Their shows are so good. Yeah. All their shows are so good. It, it could be intimidating to try mm. to live up to, you know, Kimmy and 30 Rock and, and just them in general, right? Um, but what I choose to do <laughs> is... Um, is to find comfort in the fact that they really know what they're doing. Okay. And I'm just going to play. I'm just going to try to not laugh, you know, and take oh, very sure. seriously. Cause like, that's what works in comedy that you're not trying to make anybody laugh. You know, it's really that you're very seriously trying to do this thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to try to take myself as seriously as Wiki takes herself in this moment. And um, let me tell you, who's not going to miss anything. It's Meredith Scardino. Like she is always sitting there every minute of every day um, with a better idea. If you, if, if you didn't mm -hmm. nail it, she's, she's like, well, you know what, why don't you? And, um, and if she doesn't say it, like somebody's going to either Tina's going to have have been hiding in a corner and you didn't even know she was there or yeah. somebody's going to bring her in on a cell phone or on a laptop and she's going to be like hi you know you know <laughs> holding the laptop up in your face so you have a lot of there there is a lot of oversight hmm. in a way that's not annoying in a way that's life-saving right it's like a cult it's like a set where 
play is taken very seriously? Yes, play is taken very seriously. And and we have to, you know, there it's a learning curve because we mm -hmm. were shooting in COVID. We don't have a gazillion dollars. It's extremely ambitious to try to do all, we're, we're flashbacking every five minutes. Yeah. You know, somebody says something and then there's a flashback to us doing this thing. And at some point in the pilot, I feel like they were like, you know what? We don't really have time for you guys to, to, to you know, like, like, can we think about like a sketch on SNL more than like we're really doing it? You know, because we would have been mm -hmm. in the makeup hair chair forever. Um, as oh, seriously, yeah. you know, as you know, we were trying to pull off '90s flashbacks, and every everything changes. The hair changes, the makeup changes, the, you know, and uh, they were they they were always trying to scale back a little bit so we could hit what was important. And I think watching it, they did a really good job of balancing those things. Yeah, it's it sort of synthesizes many of your different. I want to ask. I, I want to ask. Like we're always asking for take us back to the very beginning and your journey through the biz and whatever. Where does like you've studied Shakespeare, musical theater, regular theater, and I know there was there was quite a bit of like, um, I know you studied jazz, jazz oh, music. Oh yeah. How yeah. does all of this like? What is the training background? What would you say is your training background, and how does it all? Is it all of a piece? Is it a holistic approach to each and every role? I think um, the first thing you have the real battle is in your mind. Honestly, I I, I don't know that. And, you know, we're such an amalgam of like so many, we have so much influence now, fortunately, we're, I don't think that we're stuck in a, in like that corner that used to be stuck where you only grew up listening to one radio station or your parents' mm -hmm. music anymore. Like we really, you know, we are what Hamilton used to be, which is a mixtape of so many things. And um, I just, I, I can't, I don't think that I'm different from other people and that I don't have a reference point for about everything. Um, but, but, but I'm not an expert, you know? And mm. so I think, um, you just have to have the audacity to show up and try some of these things. Hmm. And then if it works, people might be like, oh yeah, that's why, because she has a master's degree in jazz. <laughs> like, you know, you don't want to lead with that in case you blow it, but if it works, somebody oh, will have a way to point to what maybe makes it, you know, like rap, like, you know, I, I, yes. I'm, I, I, I'm a rapper, you know, and people <laughs> used to ask me all the time, like, wow, I mean, how did you, and were you always rapping? And where did you learn? Or did you have to start, you know, I'm like, I've been rap. Don't we all grow up listening to like, right. you know, on some level, even if you weren't deep in it, like you heard LL Cool J, you know, at least sure you heard enough of it that it's there. So that that's my feeling. Yes. I, Yes, I've studied this. Yes, I have degrees. Um, yes, I um, yes, I've been around a long ass time. <laughs> yes, I, I've been around long enough to have had so many versions of my career. I am not twenty something, you know. Uh. So um, at some point, I definitely had a five years to spare where I could learn some jazz. I had a four or five years <laughs> I could do some Shakespeare. I mean, I have had some time in my in my time to to kind of be around different things. But the reason I was around them was just because there was um, an opportunity and I didn't say mm. no. Like mm. I was like, all right, I'll try it until somebody kicks me out of here, you know? Yes, that is so That is so pure gold on specifically this podcast. Like I'm cracking up at the idea that it's my job. It's my job on this podcast to be like, Renee, how did this exact class in college lead to this <laughs> exact role? But it's never that, that's not the life of an actor at all. It's no. all blended together and you're just a human person who has all of these experiences. That's so true. And and you never know. Um, I mean, I think our biggest pain is feeling like we've worked hard to do something and we don't get a chance to do it. That's 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 um that's the mm. biggest fear is um is that, you know, because we because gosh, I mean, think about all of over this last year and a half, yeah. all of the people that have sat in Zoom class. You know, Zoom dance class, Zoom piano class, Zoom, you know, Zoom readings. Like we are still trying, even stuck in our homes, even separated from each other. And the pain that it would be for not is is crazy. Um, the hmm. opportunity that we have in the world that we live in now is uh, we don't have to wait for somebody to pick us to do those things. Yeah, we can truly just do them on our own. And I don't know how far the reach will be, um, mm -hmm. but the, but, but, but there's never going to be any reach at all if, if we don't do it. So, um, so yeah, I've, I've been able to do a lot of things. Um, some of them better than others. 
Um, but most often, um, most often the, the biggest battle was just um, showing up. Showing up. And I love that. I love your tip of like, don't walk in with, I did this and this and this. And it's only after the fact that someone's <laughs> like, you did these things and that prepared you for this that you're like, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know what I, I do? I, I should add one other thing. Probably the, the, the most important key to my success has been friends. Um, okay. Humility. I mean, I, I'm well aware. I, I'm more aware anytime I'm starting something of why I shouldn't have gotten this job than okay. why I should. I'm super aware of, of what I don't know. I'm typically surrounded by people that are seeped in the thing we're doing. If it's a play at the public, I am un, I'm ill-prepared compared to Mm. Um, the people that have been there whose entire life has been the study of this, of this. And, uh, so I know that there's a deficit and I have to work really hard. And I also know that no matter how hard I work, I will never, I will never bridge that gap. And so I need to be really nice <laughs> to everybody, <laughs> everybody so that they root for me and they help me. <laughs> and that has worked well for me. <laughs> and that's great advice. I mean, it really, it really is like, and don't you, don't you kind of want to be the person with the least experience in the room so that you can, so that you can learn? Yeah, absolutely. And rise to the challenge. Yeah. You know, absolutely. You, you want to, you, well, the, the, the value of being the person with the least experience is perhaps there's the lowest expectation of how well sure. you're going to do. So maybe there's a little less pressure on you and you can surprise people. Yeah. Um, but um, mm. I, I, I've had both, you know, I, like I said, I've, I've been around a while. So, you know, I, I used to be the youngest in the room and now I'm rarely, I mean, if there's somebody else anywhere near my age, I'm like, hey. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I feel like as time goes on, I'll, I, I mean, I hopefully will be, you know, one of the more experienced. I don't know. I think the, mm. the reason why that doesn't happen so often is that I'm always doing something crazy and new. Sure. Well, and the other interesting thing about, just about these interviews, like this podcast, is that we are here only talking about the results that we see and not to make you relive all of your traumas, but like, and your worst audition, I'm gonna ask you for your worst audition horror story. <laughs> um, like, what is your relationship with that idea of the imposter syndrome? Do you ever have to talk yourself out of that and get out of your head of, of getting more towards a place of like, I've earned this role or I deserve this? Oh my gosh, every minute of my life. I don't know that that goes away because you've had some successes. I think it's I think it's worse. Maybe it's not fair to say worse, but definitely, you know, you you fail on on seemingly larger stages. Um I um yeah, I gosh, I, I mean even before everything I post on Instagram, <laughs> I'm like, "Oh god. Oh god. I think I just posted a picture of myself in a bathing suit, which is ridiculous, but I was just like, "Oh god." Like I always feel like this is ridiculous. What am I doing? Everybody's going to be like, "Ah, oh, I hate her," you know. And um and I and then every once in a while I do something and uh and you know, it strikes a chord. I I guess I guess the 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 job is to just uh I I, I mean I'm sitting around studio equipment, like um, I'm trying to do an album now, and and I, I I this is I did this before I did anything, honestly. Before I ever came to Broadway, I, I was I was recording music um, in you know a, somebody's uh, garage studio in Los Angeles. That's what I wanted. I you know remember, do you remember Lilith Fair? <laughs> Or are you too young yes. for that? <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be sitting there with a the guitar like Jewel, that one right there, yeah. you know, and singing yes. so these songs I wrote and all these melodies and all these lyrics that were in my head. And somebody had told me when I got out of school, Carnegie Mellon, that if I, um, you know, why would I, why, why would you go and try to do Broadway first? If you want to do everything, why don't you try to get famous? And oh. then, you know, like if they used to say, somebody said to me, if you come straight to Broadway, you're going to audition against the most talented people in the world. And mm. the best that's going to happen to you is that you're going to understudy some name. Mm. 
So why would you not, if you also want to be a recording artist, why would you not do that now? Because by the time you've graduated from undergrad, you're already too old to be a recording artist. That's what I was told. I mean, like, if you oh, think God. about it, like, you know, Alicia Keys was like 13, like you're already too old. So why don't you try that first? So I, 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 I came to New York first. I did a couple of, you know, regional those shows, and then I went straight to LA. And that's why I went back to school to do jazz studies. And I started writing music and, and you know, you know, trying to make that happen. And at some point I got on Allie McBeal mm -hmm. and started singing backup. And that was really just only to kind of supplement my life while I was trying to get a record deal. And then at some point I did an independent film that did well and reminded yeah. me that I'm an actor. And then at some point in the midst of all of it, when I decided that I want to write movies and record movies and have a record deal, somebody called and asked if I wanted to be in the Lion King on Broadway. And I, and I at first was like, no, only because I thought, you know, the Tony committee isn't coming back. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And no one's, oh. gonna, everyone I know has already seen The Lion King. I had already auditioned in LA. I was not around for the original production. I mean, I was around, but I was, it was actually the only thing I'm too young for in the world. And, oh. uh, and then uh, well, I was in LA when they came there and I auditioned, I didn't get it. And, uh, oh. and yeah. And so when they called and they called me again to like audition to be a recast in the, in the Broadway production, my first thought was, you know, who's, who's going to care? Like, I don't know anybody that hasn't seen the show yet. I didn't know mm. people keep having children and it will always be relevant at the time. I was oh. thinking, right. you know, I thought that way. Thank God, you know, it took me about five minutes to like wake up and realize that the dream started with Broadway and I should at least go do it for a year. So I could say that I, I had done Broadway once and in my life, once in my life. So I, I came to New York, um, as a, as a girl that was trying to get a record deal with two suitcases and two dogs and a fiance in 2002. Mm -hmm. And it's 2021 and I'm still here. <laughs> it was the right choice. But I think you. the question was something about the imposter syndrome. When it comes mm -hmm. to now revisiting being a recording artist, I'm like, is this crazy? Am I, am I an imposter? Um, you just have to, well, I should say that's the beauty of mediocrity. Oh my God. It, yes. That is, um, you know, if everybody was Stevie Wonder, if everybody was, you know, Kristen Chenoweth, if everybody was <laughs> the, the kind of this perfect thing of what yeah. it's supposed to be, nobody would ever try. Uh, yes. the, the thing that's beautiful is that like s the airwaves are filled with very mediocre things that you <laughs> think, well, shit, I could at least do that, you know? <laughs> Right. And so it gives Absolutely. you the audacity to try because like most, most of the things that you see are just okay. Yeah. Um, there's brilliance, but there's a lot that's okay. And thank God for the okay. Yes. <laughs> because that's the reason why anybody ever tries anything that's not completely self-absorbed. Yeah. That's such a brilliant way of putting it. I, I do think about that a lot because I kind of feel like I steep myself in only the best stuff to the point that it becomes unattainable. Oh yeah. But it's any field. That it, I feel like it's a calling card. It's it's an entry point, mm. it's a gateway. You know what I mean? You yeah. can try this too. And nobody's going to boo you. We're gonna show up, we're gonna watch it, we're gonna have some criticisms and some ideas. But there is there this is a playing field. And you're allowed yes. to come and try and play here. It's called trial and error yeah. for a reason. <laughs> Yeah, like striving for perfection while fully being conscious of the fact that you're not going to be there right away. There are examples, again, the, the creme de la creme, the Alicia Keys is a great example because at 13, there she is already a fully formed pop star ready to go. Wow. But if you just think about that and go, you're just going to feel defeated, right? You're just going to feel like, well, I can't do that. So absolutely. If, if, it's if, better if, if listen my first to Alicia song Keys. is not falling, I should not, I should not stop trying. <laughs> yeah, keep trying. Yeah. <laughs> I also think an emerging theme here and in what you're saying and in your career is like, do not limit yourself to one thing and allow the dream to change, right? Especially in such a crazy, crazy industry. Your dreams of being a recording artist now is different from 10 years ago, is different from 20 years ago. And yeah, like, you know, and, and leave room for, uh, you know, I, I should say, have a sense of humor. <laughs> um, I, yeah. I, I believe, you know, I believe my career should be an example to people that 
anyone can do it. I, I mean, I think I, I just feel like I, I, I do because I think there are some people that are so freakishly talented that, you know, it's like, well, yeah. Um, I think like some of the things, and I'm not saying that I'm not talented or that I have no, you know, I don't deserve to be here. I'm just saying that it should be, especially as I get older, you know, you should be like, wow, she's still wearing that on that show. You know, like you should, you know, you should feel, um, I feel like these things happen to me and it's kind of funny and, and uh, I'm up for it. Like, okay. You know, because maybe somebody else will think, well, you know what? I'm going to try again. You know, cool. you know what? I'm going to wear that. I'm going to record that song. I'm going to audition for that play. I'm going to take that class. I'm going to, you know, because if Renee <laughs> is still here doing this, especially if you know me, you'll really know what I'm talking about. If Renee is still here doing this, it must mean that I can do it too. That's my prayer that I can do it too. If <laughs> Renee has a Tony, right? I'm going to say, if you went to school with me, I, you would never have thought you would have really liked me because I all you know I you, I told you what what I think of friends right you would have you sure. would have think, you would have thought I was your girl because I'm like I'm down for you I'm your friend but you also would not think that I was the one that was going to end up with a Tony because there were just too many talented people with way more experience way more talented could do way more things better it's it's almost comical and um, and so for that reason I think you know let it inspire you. Yeah. And as you said, it's your Tony Awards acceptance speech was so beautiful. And you touched on this idea that you had children and you basically touched on the idea of a work life balance of being able to uh, attain a high level of, of success in your career while also like being a mom. And it sounds like that is part of your artistic mission is to is to empower maybe especially other women. Yeah. Well, we don't, that. you know, yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't know that we know what a mission is mm. when we start it. Um, but, you know, yeah. sometimes our life takes turns and you learn things and, and hopefully you kind of talk out loud about them. I mean, I've had, you know, in this business, um, some pretty public, you know, losses and, um, and why, like why? And I, I, I think, you know, the beauty of it for me, I, I learned is that, People don't necessarily need an example of how to win a Tony, but they do. But they could use an example of how to lose a child. Do you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that's that's important to me. And so when I look back at my life and I think about a Tony and why that would happen to me, I'm definitely not the most worthy or deserving of the other women I was nominated against by a long shot. But I was given an opportunity to stand on that stage and talk about the miracle in my life because I had spent so much time um, not being able to like full throttle go for my career because I thought mm. maybe I'll get pregnant. Maybe it'll work, you know, maybe it'll work. And like so many conversations with like people that were huge champions for me, like Kathleen Marshall or, or people like at different times in my career who had believed in me and like given me a shot and something could have happened. And do you want to do this thing, Renee? And I would love to, but I'm going to do a round of IVF and I don't know for sure if I'm going to be pregnant and like, you know, just so many conversations like that in my life and my career. Um, because I just knew at the end of it that, um, I had this window of time to try and mm. I didn't want to miss it. And, um, and yeah, like when I was in the color purple and on a soap opera, One Life to Live and really, really like the busiest girl in the world, I thought I was also very pregnant and I lost a baby like right after they had announced it. And I was like, gosh, why did that happen? Like the day after they announced it. And then I realized, oh, it's because, um, because, you know, people, I don't know what I thought in the moment, but definitely I'm like, okay, well, I'm doing this, you know, publicly. Right. And and I, I, I was aware when um, I was standing on that stage, it just like became crystal clear because it was the 10th anniversary mm -hmm. of the color purple. Their second uh -huh. round was then. So I was standing mm -hmm. on that stage and I saw the producers of the color purple sitting there and, you know, people that just in my theater family who had been there for me um, and seen me lose. So lose something um, to be able to be like, look, guys, I have yeah. this Tony. And I have this thing that I was fighting for for so long, and I want you to celebrate this with me. I, I just feel like that's that was the that was the opportunity for being the one that got to give the speech that night. Yeah, thank you so much for for going there and for illuminating that because it's it's something we don't get to talk about so much on this podcast with with 
I think particularly women who want to be, who want that work-life balance, who want success in both areas, however you, de- however you define success. Yeah, I, I spend a lot of, it's, hard, it's confusing and hard. I think we're better at it as women now than we were because I think when I came up, the women that were like uh, in front of me and 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 very successful, I feel like there was some stigma to being a mom. Um, and then there was a group of women that were younger, like like as though it would take away from their career, they would no longer be able to be an ingenue. And then there was a group of women that were younger than me, like um, Britney Spears, Nicole Richie, Jessica Alba, like they're younger than me. And they were like, you know, Michelle um, Williams, like, you know, they were like 20 years old and they had babies, right? Sure. And it was like such a beautiful, powerful moment. I think it just changed people's minds. And so mm-hmm. I like to be a cheerleader for women that says you don't have to choose if you want to do this take the risk and believe that there will be opportunity for you on the other side and you will be a better artist because of the because of the the risk and the trial you know you'll be you'll be better that's 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 what i try to preach yeah that trial and error again yeah and it seems like um this idea too of are we getting more and more as an industry towards this place of individual artists should feel can feel empowered to make their own work and oh yeah. Write your own scripted comedy and while you're recording your own album, while you're taking improv classes, like spreading yourself out again to not define yourself as one thing, right? One lane. I think that's one of the silver linings of COVID, both things. We we realized, mm. oh wow, guess what? If you did not if you did not invest in your home life, you had a pretty depressing 2020. Yes. Right? If your whole life was about your career, you really regretted that choice. <laughs> Um, for a large part of that year we just went through. And the other thing that you had, you were forced to do, which is come up with some way to be an artist that doesn't involve many other people. Yeah. And that made us, um, that made us kind of think, well, what I'm, you know, what, what I'm, you know, I'm going to film myself doing this choreography of my own in this corner of my apartment. Like, I think that was a beautiful, um, that's a beautiful gift that I think will continue to reap the rewards of when we open again. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems like are, are we're about to transition to this moment of maybe swinging in the other direction of like, let's just, let's really collaborate. Let's go big. Yeah. Like, yeah. Girls 5 Eva on Broadway. I don't know. <laughs> that would be amazing. Girls 5 Eva on Broadway. I literally I'm just came up with that. person that said that. Guess what? You're not going to be the last, okay? Um, we got to make that happen. Great idea. You know, I, I, my, in my heart, there's like this bottleneck like it's like it's like we're about to explode we're gonna burst forth because we've been you know like we've been stuck you know and we're gonna just burst through with all of this creativity that we've been dreaming of it's gonna be you know this roaring 20s you know just kind Mm. of spring of 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 creativity um it's like you know the diamond that has been you know pressured into being this shimmer thing that's that's what we're going to be and hopefully because we've had so much time to think about how to do it better it won't just be a creative improvement it will be will be more inclusive in in the ways that we've learned over this past several months yeah the limitations are teaching us yeah if if those you know when those limitations are lifted we're then like more keyed into our creativity and ready to ready to go, maybe. Maybe, I, I believe it. I'm an optimist. It's, that's super inspiring, thank you. Yes, I need to hear that. I'm getting my second shot in a couple of days and I've, I've, I feel ready to, I'm like, burst out of that bottleneck. Really yeah, yeah that, that just to sort of harken back to my bathing suit photo. I posted it, I was yeah. like, why am I doing this? I posted it, not because I think I look great, believe me, I posted it because I'm trying to like subtly manipulate anybody that follows me to to dream of life post vaccination. Um, somebody told yeah. me that there's a large part of the black community that isn't vaccinated and they're afraid. And I just want like I posted a video with my mom re- reuniting with my mom when she came mm-hmm. back. I posted like a, a you know a trip that I couldn't take you know while mm-hmm. before I was double vaccinated. You know, hoping that people will find um, a reason a reason to do this one thing, which is, um, which is the kind of one of the few gifts that we can do. You know, we're not, we're not essential workers. What can we do? And one Mm -hmm. of them is to take that risk to get vaccinated and and to trust. Um, And so the reward for that, I think, is um, the things we're talking about, like this kind of spring of creativity and the, and the, and the, 
the reward of opening again. Somebody just said it's going to be July or September. I don't know which one. For theater. Yeah, for theater. Yeah. And create creating um, a safe way for us to come together and and do our favorite thing in the world, and that is um, sit in the dark and tell stories. Yeah, I'm gonna cry my eyes out. Whatever the show is that I'm seeing, oh I don't god. know what it's gonna be. Oh my god! Even if it is Girls by Bebo on Broadway, I'm gonna <laughs> cry my eyes out. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, going off of that, and we don't have to get we don't have to get into this we don't have to get into this specifically. But um, this podcast just aired an episode on safety and parity in the industry. We spoke to the president of Times Up, and I asked her about Scott Rudin. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but because we were just talking about this idea of reopening the arts, uh, what are what are your thoughts on the state of the industry again in terms of this reopening? Can is there hope <laughs> for rebuilding? in a way that creates more equitable systems and more opportunity for a greater diversity of artists. Yeah, I mean, we don't, I, I, I have to say, it, you just reminded me of something. Um, you know, Hamilton came out and it was gonna be about Hamilton and COVID and then George Floyd was murdered and it became about this Black Lives Matter summer. Yeah. And I was doing a lot and I was grateful because I, I didn't, I, I'm not very good at promoting myself, but I, I knew I, I, I felt very empowered, empowered and excited to um, to talk, to use that platform to talk about, you know, you know, equity, inclusion and the lives of, of black people. You know, I was I was really excited about that. But I was worried when I look back. God, it's been so long, even even. Even that seems a long time ago. Yeah. Um, because I, when I was talking about it then, I was like, I don't know. By the time theater opens, and as desperately and how as gutted as we will have been financially, that anyone is going to be able to afford to be inclusive in terms of the programming, because we're going to be so. I mean, at the end of the day, you have a luxury to be inclusive, but you have to make money. You have to you have to do something to get people back in the seats. And I just felt a bit jaded that by the time we could get back, we could actually afford to do any of these lofty ideas. Um, I really did feel that way, and I don't feel that way right now. I okay. think it's because um, because we're not we didn't stop protesting when the verdict came out. Do yeah. you know what I'm saying? We weren't we 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 didn't we didn't say well we had a whole slew of of people that you know we needed to out that had all this power that were abusing it and we're done with that now we're we're not me tooing anymore we're we we didn't do yeah. that like we're still we're still on guard we're still saying yeah. wait a minute. We've never talked about this one, you know. We're still doing it, and it's not that it's trendy to do. You know, we're not, it's not like it's not like we're still putting black squares on Instagram. We, it's not trendy, but we, but it's part of. It seems to me like it's seeped in as part of who we are, and it gives me more hope that we actually will. Um, people are still on. People are not. It's not going to be enough that we're sitting here. If you don't do, if yeah. you don't do some of this work. <laughs> And try to change. I, there are still people that will that will that will that will call you out, and yeah. thank God. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think we were all wondering if it's a passing fad, and it's maybe enough in our cultural consciousness that something really shifted last summer. I hope so. Um, because there's no so because it's it's just an endless it's an endless kind of stream of shocking. Uh, you know, just shocking events that, that just make you realize how far we have to go. Yeah. Um, and that that doesn't end. It's tireless. You know, I mean, it's like it's it just it doesn't end. And so I think we're settling into um, a reality that's different than the one that I grew up in. You know, I grew up in in Texas in the 80s. Um, you know, in a, in a very, you know, in a very kind of wealthy neighborhood where I'm like the only black, the only everything. And, mm. um, and I always, you know, felt very aware of discrimination, but I always felt like it was like, oh, your, their grandparents are, are racist. Like it was, it always felt like something that was in the rear view mirror. Mm. And, um, and it is so clearly not now. Yeah. Um, and that's so devastating. Um, but it also, you know, you can't fix something if you don't know, how deep the problem is. And I don't think anyone is, I mean, I'm sure somebody is, but so at least as artists, I don't think we're disillusioned 
mm. you know, any, I mean, we, we, the, the, I should say the illusion is, is gone. We're clear yeah. about the fact that this is worse than we ever thought. Every time something comes out where it's even more, it's even more of a reminder of how much work we have to do. Mm. The illusion is gone. That's so, yeah, that so hits the nail on the head. Yeah. And, and, and I think most importantly, um, you know, I think the reason why so many people kind of hate artists and our soapboxes um, is because we are hypocrites, <laughs> you oh my know, God. and, um, and I feel the beauty is uh, we, we have been exposed to ourselves. That's what, so that's what's changed in the last year, I, a, from a year ago. I, I believe, so. yeah. I believe it has, because, you know, what's changed is, uh, is you know we've changed you and i have changed and we know that we know what to we know what's unacceptable now yeah the the process of um for lack of a better word like enlightenment and yeah. just having your eyes open wider and wider wider and wider <laughs> yeah um thank you so much renee i this is so wonderful i have to ask you i'm sure you've been asked it many times before in i mean in this last year what was Revisiting Hamilton like? Did you watch it? I asked David the same thing, and he was kind of like, I watched every scene that I was not in. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't do that for a very long time. Um, yeah, yeah, I did watch it right away. I remember sure. like fussing at David because um, we were not, it, it, we, it was impossible to speak about that film until we saw it. Okay. Our experience of doing it is very different than the experience of watching that film. It's another genre. It's another artistic gift coming into this, our world. It's like, yeah. it's editing and it's the camera and it's, you know, it's, it's why Tommy Kale had to be the one direct to direct this movie. It's, you know, so not only had we never actually seen it before, but this is, this was not just like having seen it from a seat in, in the theater. This was, mm -hmm. um, this was a camera that can be anywhere that can tell a story just by the cuts and edits by, you know, you know, you know, at, in the hands of a person that had put the thing together in the theater. Hmm. And um, it was it was a beautiful thing. It was really scary to watch. Um, I, it's, it, I have to say, you know, it's 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 all I it's all that I wanted because I was in rent when we filmed it. I, I was in the closing company of rent and I know that yeah. um there's no no one that's more mimi than daphne rubin vega like she was like literally the costume is the clothes she was wearing that day you know but because mm. they filmed because i'm one of the people that was filmed playing mimi some kids come up to me like oh you're my mimi you know i'm like really you're the mimi. i did it for like four months but thank you it's the power right. of uh of that they shot they you know jeffrey um they, they shot it on our closing night and they put it together beautifully it's the same people that did hamilton actually and um and and they did a beautiful job and it's the first time mm. i ever saw anything that was filmed of a theater piece that i thought did it any justice in the world it's because the the director knew and loved the thing knew and loved the theater and so it worked and so anyway because i knew that was so powerful i just kept saying you guys the most important thing that can happen to us is that they film us before we leave so i was it was mm. a gift to me when they did it and yeah. at the same time it's torturous because uh -huh. i maybe performed that i haven't counted i'm sure tommy kale is because he knows every number but like thousands of times I, yeah. I you know i came around on that turnstile and said you know <laughs> i remember that night you know what i mean i've done that i've done that thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times and once is recorded <laughs> You Isn't know, that wild? once at the end, you know, once, once a few years later, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, is, is representative of, of years of, of a journey with, uh, with the moment. Yeah. It's, you're so right. It, it very much is its own genre. This, it's such a weird thing to think of the one performance that was filmed. And okay. I, it's sort of like, maybe you must've been feeling the pressure on the day of the filming. But looking back, it's even it's even more pressure. I don't know. It's a weird. Well, I, I what I've learned to do as I get older <laughs> is um, I, I feel like we always experience life um, from the moment before. So we're like, oh, I'm old, or I look terrible, or <laughs> I, you know, because we're remembering the you the, the us that was younger, right? You know. Ah. So like, if I looked at myself today at twenty whatever, I might be like, 
oh God, you know, go to sleep, get some rest. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, um, but if I, but what really happens, all I have in front of me is me looking back at today and being like, girl, you look good. You know, yes. all I have is uh, all I will, you know, no matter how freaked I am, freaked out I am in a moment, in the future, I will never have looked better than right now. I will never <laughs> have been more successful. I will never have, you know, most likely, mm. it, I will only have like, ooh, I will be comparing it to a, a me that I don't know yet, right? And yeah. so I try to put that, I don't wanna wait, I guess I don't wanna waste today mm. on s some thought I had, you know, from a perspective of some younger me, like what a waste of today. Yes. Like what if I lived today and thought, you know, felt about myself, like I'm gonna feel when I'm 85 looking at me, you know? Yeah. And so I do mm. that like with the performance. So like, it's, so I, to think, like I could shred my, the, the one performance they got of me doing Angelica Schuyler so yeah. severely. Sure. I mean, like I could shred that thing to death because I Imposter know so well and I know my long journey with it, but I choose to look at it <laughs> like I'm going to, I believe, when I am an older lady and probably can't get down those stairs the same way <laughs> <laughs> or remember yeah. that many words. I don't know. Yeah. I choose to look at it like I will look like, look at it and just be just be grateful for the beauty that's around me and the beauty that I feel inside and and for the miracle. Yeah, that's a really beautiful, that's a really cool way of looking at um, how to stay in the moment and, mm -hmm. as an artist or as a person. That's great. Um, I have to let you go soon. Thank you so much. This is so great. Um, we ask very silly backstage -y questions. I mean, not okay. silly, but I said I was going to ask for your worst audition horror story because we love reliving traumas on this podcast. <laughs> Do you have a go-to? Oh my God, I have so many, but the first one that comes to my mind probably is a dance audition for Aida on Broadway. So I was living in LA and I was uh, not really doing theater. I was like trying to get a record deal and uh, doing some like singing back up on Ally Meet the Old Thip or things like that. But because I had come, I had come to New LA from New York. So some casting people did know me and gotcha. You know, I, I had started here. I would get calls from time to time to come in on audition for like recasts, like when they would go to LA, you know, to find new talent. And uh, mm. and you know, they used to they keep these. And Aida was this big thing on Broadway, and it was really hard to find somebody that could do the understudy of Aida mm. because I think the woman that initially was the understudy it could even be my friend Shelley Williams. I'm not really sure, but whoever, whatever woman that created the track of the understudy for Aida on Broadway, whoever understudied Heather Headley. Mm -hmm. also was the dance captain okay it, it's a terrible idea <laughs> because ooh. you have to find this one woman and clearly she was the one that initiated who created the track um could sing aida yeah. <laughs> act aida and do that genius choreography and teach it okay teach it i mean like what freaking one person in the world could do that, right? So needless to say, they searched, they, when they had to replace that track, they had to search far and wide to find that person. And um, so they came to, to LA and I'm sure I, I sang, you know, I sang it and they were like, oh, okay. And then I probably did the scenes and that went really well. And so they said, you know, we're gonna bring you into a dance audition. <laughs> For I, you know, I was like, okay, you know, so I rolled up in there, you know, my little self, you know, <laughs> God. And they were like, it's actually a dance call for dancers. <laughs> we know you don't have to like, you know, you don't have to, we don't expect you to be able to do it as well as the dancers, but you know, that's the one, one we're having. So, mm. <laughs> oh God. So I, uh, so I went up in there with my little, you know, cute, I'm from LA, right? So I got my cute little, my body at the time was cute. So I like my little cute, whatever, you, you know, dance leotard, whatever, let's get physical thing I had on. And, um, and like, and I remember like stretching before and I look like a dancer, right? Sure. So I remember walking in there and stretching and all the girls being like, who's this bitch up in here? Like we ain't seen her at audition for like nervous, like worried about me. Like I was a threat. Okay. <laughs> While I'm stretching, they're like, you could tell they were like, who's this bitch up in here? Right. And then <laughs> let me tell you, it was about three minutes into the, to the audition. They were like, never mind, let's help her out. Okay. <laughs> Cause I was like, I was like, woo! Like it was so hard. And the worst part was like there was a lot of choreography on the floor, and they all knew to have knee pads, and I didn't. 
Oh. So yeah. there was all this like, throw your body on the floor, roll around, Ooh. get up. Every time I would go down, I'd be like, ah, it was horrible. <laughs> Terribly embarrassing. Needless to say, I did not come to New York for Aida. I came <laughs> many years later for the Lion King. Yeah. That's amazing. I love the uh, uh, competitive turning to uh, friendly environment out. of an audition. Yeah. <laughs> Very sort competitive of... to how can we help this poor thing? <laughs> it's the longest well, sort of hour of my life. Sort of goes back to the Andrew Rannells moment of like actors ask each other for help. And that's a good, that's a good working environment, right? Oh my God. Be lean on it. Unless you're stupid. Um, yeah, we lean on each other. We, you know, we, we, uh, we hold each other's hand. We, yeah. we, and not just people that are like, I, not just people in a show together. Like most of my best friends are people that, you know, play could, could have played Angelica before me and after me. Like we, we, we met at auditions and, yeah. uh, and we love each other and we root for each other. And I could tell you right now, Oh, you know, who you need to get, you need to get, like, I could tell you, you need call Anika Noni Rose. She'd be really good at this. Right. Call Karen Olivo. She would kill it. Like, you know, like we, we know, um, we're aware of each other and know how great each other are. And, you know, you get this one, maybe I'll get the next one. Like, you know, but, um, but, but yeah. we cheer for each other. I mean, I, I mean, LaShawn's like, uh. and I think of like these people that are in this business that are, they're just, my sisters, like they, they're the light in this, in the room for me. Um, and I'm, you know, gosh, I mean, when you think about the women that kill at this game, they are very, very aware of how powerfully they can help other women. Yeah. That is really beautiful to hear. You're talking to like the number one LaChance, LaChance like basically changed my life. So. <laughs> oh God, mine too. Mine too. I'm sure. Yeah. The, that that all, that list of actresses is like, whew. yeah. Um, do you going on to that? Do you have a favorite performance that you think every actor should see and study, and why? Oh God, so many, um, and most of them are, are in theater and they're not filmed. Yeah. Um, and I I could talk about oh gosh, even little random ones that you wouldn't think about, but maybe the first one comes to mind. I remember Felicia Rashad in. Um, Gosh, what was that? What was the what was that show? Um, I just anytime you see Felicia Rashad in anything ever. Sure. Um, yeah. But I, I remember um, I remember seeing her on stage for the first time, and you know I remember having grown up with her on television, mm -hmm. and I remember just being so comforted by the fact that those skills are so transferable. And mm. there's no, people used to always ask what, you know, is there something different that you're doing on television that you're doing in film that you're doing in theater? And I, I've seen a lot of really wonderful performers prove that the smallest, the smallest discovery or thought, you know, oh gosh, it, you know, goes to the back of the room. Like, you know, it's like, it pierces a room and, and the biggest revelation and a burst of joy or pain also works in the mm. biggest house and on the smallest screen. And, and when you've seen people like Felicia, like Frances McDormand, who, you know, who just won yes. another Oscar, who I got the, yes. you know, the, the privilege of, of acting opposite um, in Good People. Like when you think of, you know, like the proximity I've had to just so, so just heroes and yeah. watching them so fluidly um, move between not only acting and, and singing in different mediums, but directing and writing and, you know, uh, gosh, they're just, they're, these people are, are, are redefining what we can do every minute of every day. Mm. Ah, beautiful. Um, that moment when Frances McDormand swings this, the, um, what was it, the ceramic statue oh, thing God. over her head, like she's going to break it and the entire oh. audience gasped. Oh my God. I, oh my God. I still think about that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Renee. Uh, any any last words of wisdom for like early career actors? We've spoken a lot about like looking back on your career, but is you know is there any advice that you would give your younger self? Ooh, don't think it has to happen in the time frame the world tells you. Okay. Don't say no to yourself, and make friends. 
make friends, oh. support people. Oh, and one more make friends, you know, champion and support other people and invest in something alongside of your artistic vision quest invest in your in your relationships in yourself in your family and in, in invest in that um one or the two of them is gonna happen for you and maybe both oh, you just wove together every element of this interview like so perfectly <laughs> thank you so much you're so welcome so lovely to talk And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. Hi, guys. Christine McKenna Torella here. Renee Elise Goldberry has had a varied and very successful career, everything from musicals to TV and film. And I'm very excited to see this Girls 5 Ever series because I love all the team that's involved. And also to age myself, I grew up with the girl band boy band era of the 90s and I probably bought every one of the one hit wonders that were out there on on tape and cd right when people had to do that instead of just like pressing a button on their phone I loved in particular that Renee gave a lot of really great advice for early career actors and just actors in general and the audition technique. And one thing that she spoke about in the interview was mindset and how the real battle is in your mind. And I know I spend a lot of time talking about mindset type topics here, but it's because I think it's such an important component of a successful acting career. And I thought I'd highlight this week things that we're doing over at Backstage to help you feel as confident as you can in the audition space and cultivate a healthy mindset. So um, recently, Joseph Perlman, who's one of our Backstage experts, he's done a lot of columns with us. He did a lot of material during COVID for us on our YouTube channel. He held an actor's toolkit on cultivating confidence in the audition room. He goes through a manifesting exercise in this class um, with the audience and the actors that he works with. And perhaps most importantly, he talks about how to bring your full, authentic self to the audition room, right? Come as yourself. I think that's just such an important message. Don't be anyone else or what you think someone wants. Be you. It's an excellent class and it's available free on Backstage's YouTube channel. But we actually hold the classes live, right? So um, you can sign up to be part of the live class. You can sign up if you're a subscriber to be one of the actors that we work with. And we've got two live classes that I want to highlight. So we've got the Actors Toolkit and we have Audition Insider. And we do one a month of each of these. And with Audition Insider, we're talking about how to be successful in the audition room. And we're talking to casting directors for that, right? And they're giving direct advice to you guys. And if you come to the class live, you get to ask questions yourself. And of course, you might be one of the actors that we work with. And for Actors Toolkit, I've been one of the hosts for it. Joseph's been one of the hosts for it. We'll kind of switch in a night. But we do kind of foundational topics and elements to help you land more auditions and get cast in more projects. So we're answering really a lot of foundational things about headshot resumes, demo reels, what trends are happening so that you can kind of get ahead of them and know what you should be applying for, etc. It's all free. We put it up on the YouTube channel. So after the class, so subscribe there um, so that you don't miss something. It's just such a great resource that we're doing. I'm really excited about the series. We also give a workbook out to support the class. So it has backstage articles and guides included. So check it out. Take a look at those two things. I want to leave us with something that Renee said. I loved this particular sentence or two that she she said. That was great advice. Don't think it has to happen in the time frame the world tells you. Don't say no to yourself. Champion and support other people. Invest in something alongside your artistic vision quest. In your relationships, in yourself, in your family. Invest in that. One or two of them is really going to happen for you, and maybe all of them. On to the casting calls for this week. My British folks, there is a brand casting for Dell Computers from Camilla Arthur Casting in London. That just came on the site this morning. I'm excited to share that one. There is an antibody campaign shooting 30 and 
15 second commercials that will inform people about COVID-19 treatments. Love to hear it. Likely shooting in Indianapolis. So that's for actors that are in and around that area. I know there's a really great community of you guys over there. It pays very well. And I threw in kind of a fun one today for any big New York baseball fans. The Brooklyn Cyclones are seeking a new Sandy the Seagull. So the ideal candidate should be outgoing, works well with others, including children and fans of all ages. Professional pay for that theme gig. Take a look. All details are on this site. And of course, there are hundreds of castings for every type of actor in every region on Backstage.com. So head over there to check our castings out. That's all from me for now. Break a leg in your upcoming auditions and have a beautiful week. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Rouse Studios and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.